when I was 18, I was headed off to college, like many other 18-year-olds, far away from my working-class neighborhood in Brooklyn, where I grew up. Cornell was only a four-and-a-half-hour drive away, but it might as well have been on another planet. I was the first in my family to leave New York City, the first to go away to college. I was heading off to the Ivy League, and none of us knew what we were doing. We didn't even have any way to get me to school. My mother's car was dying, and we didn't know anyone else that we could borrow a car from. So to get me to school, my mom went out and rented a car. She came home the day before we were supposed to leave in this big blue Dodge Diplomat. And she drove up to the apartment building. My grandfather was standing outside with me, and he turned to me with this huge smile and said, they're all going to think you're rich when you drive up to school in that car. They were all going to think I was rich in that car. We really did not know what we were doing. But we did understand that I would want people to think I was something that I wasn't. So when you look at me today, I look like I belong on this stage giving a TEDx talk. But the chances that someone with my background would end up on this stage are incredibly slim. I was born to a single mother, and I was raised in poverty. I spent my whole childhood living off of government aid. All of these things made it really unlikely that I would end up on this stage or at the Ivy League. And starting my life out at the bottom of the economic ladder set me up to stay at the bottom. Less than 25% of people born into that bottom income distribution ever make it to the middle class. And in our current economy, there aren't a lot of opportunities to make it from poverty to the middle class. The primary pathway in today's economy is through education. But what happens when kids like me, who were born in that bottom income distribution, end up at those institutions of middle class transformation? Is that the end of the story? Congratulations, you made it. We might want to think so, but the truth is a lot more complicated and precarious than that. Students like me who were born in families that made less than $20,000 a year when I went to the year I went to college are much, much less likely to graduate than their classmates. In 2013, only one in five students coming out of that lowest income distribution actually got their bachelor's degree by the time they were 24. That's about the same rate as it was in 1970. On the other hand, Close to 90% of the students coming out of the top earning families got their bachelor's degree in the same period. And that's actually up from 55% in 1970. This disparity in graduation rates deepens the educational divide between those at the bottom and those at the top, and in turn contributes directly to income inequality in our country. Certainly, there are many reasons why people don't graduate, but it seems pretty clear to me if students are less and less likely to graduate as their income level goes down, then those kids at the bottom really need extra support to deal with the unusual circumstances and the unique challenges they're going to have as they try to negotiate their time in the university. So much focus is put on getting them in the door rather than what happens once they're there. And what happens once you're there? Well, if you're someone like me, the first thing you learn is to pretend because you want to try to fit in. And if you're at a university, an elite college like Cornell, in that beautiful setting, less than 5% of your classmates are going to come from that lowest income distribution. That means you're going to be in a 5% minority. And when you're in a 5% minority, you're going to feel abnormal. But you're going to try to pretend that you don't because you want to fit in. Personally, I passed as middle class for years. And it was generally easy for me because I'm white. And I also, despite growing up in Brooklyn, didn't have much of an accent. So I could pretend to be something I wasn't. But part of what you're doing is, as you go up the economic ladder, is trying to seem like you already belong there. And you're going to pass to fit in, put on that new class identity, and hope people believe you. 
Now, in the United States, we don't usually talk about class as an identity, as a, the kind of core sense of who you are, the way we think about race or ethnicity. But in order to go from one class to another, you actually have to transform your identity, leaving that old class identity behind, and that can be pretty disorienting. What would happen to the way we thought about that process if we changed the way we talked about it? In general, we use the language of improvement, right? To go from poverty to the middle class is to move up in the world. But if we thought about it differently, if instead we used language that's been used for gender identity in the recent past, and thought instead of transitioning or class reassignment, could we understand the experience of these students in a different way? Could we realize that what they're going through is a lot more of a tumultuous process than the happy, easy ending that most of us think it is? And what happens then? I think if we can change the way we think about it, if we can shift our perspective on it, then we can better support these students so that they can actually make it to graduation, which is the point. Now, that might seem like an easy thing, but it's actually not that easy to get those students to graduation because you need to give them the kind of support they need, and they're not seeking it out, right? Who wants to self-identify as the poor kid? No one can walk into a dining hall and say, oh, I'm going to go sit with the kids from the lowest income distribution, right? It's a lot harder to get them the help they need because they're going to try to seem like they don't need any help. But the truth is that Cornell knew, because of my financial aid status, that I was probably going to be dealing with things that my classmates were not necessarily going to be dealing with. And I was. Just a few months after my drive up to Ithaca in the Dodge Diplomat, I had a problem with my financial aid award that put my sophomore year in jeopardy. And I spent finals weeks that year going back and forth between studying and the financial aid office, trying to balance the stresses of getting that problem resolved with the demands of completing my academic work. At the same time, I didn't have anyone in my family that I could turn to for advice or help, and no one in the university was reaching out to me. I remember breaking down in tears one afternoon in the financial aid office, and the woman behind the counter just looking at me and shrugging and saying, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do, and sending me on my way. I walked back to my dorm that afternoon through this cold, bleak Ithaca rain, and I felt completely alone, and I really was ready to go back to Brooklyn. Now, in the end, I was lucky. I had friends that supported me, even though they didn't know what I was going through. And my problem with my financial aid got resolved and everything worked out. But that crisis almost derailed me. And even though I got through it, how many students don't? The numbers show that many, many don't. Thinking back on it now, I know that it would have been a really different experience if I'd had a support network in place that I could have turned to, that could have understood what I was dealing with. Because I didn't want to tell anyone that I couldn't pay for school. I didn't want to tell anyone that I might not be able to stay. I kept it all to myself and pretended like everything was fine. If I'd had a group in place, a support network that I could trust and who understood what I was dealing with, things could have been a lot different for me. And they could generally be a lot different for many students that are dealing with not just the kind of financial issues, but the emotional and social issues that go along with being in this environment. So how do you find that kind of network? It's not easy, but a good model to look at is the one that's been developed by the Posse Foundation. Its program puts kids from different um, high schools, public high schools from lower economic backgrounds generally, but it's a diverse group of students, and they put them into groups of 10 that they call posses. And this cohort goes to school together, so that when all those students who are non-traditional students, you know, not out of the middle class, first generation, K-12 
kids that don't necessarily have anyone to turn to in their immediate family, they already have a support network in place on campus from day one, people that they can trust. And that's really important because it's not just a financial issue of getting to graduation. It's the bigger picture of how you can support kids emotionally and socially as they enter this transitional phase of their lives. Right? If, we can, what, if we could put that kind of program in universities across the country, instead of just the 55 schools that Posse is in right now, then what would happen to that one in five graduation rate? Right? How many more kids could graduate? The Posse program has an amazing 90% graduation rate, and we could really change the outcome for students. But it starts with changing the way we think about what they're dealing with in the first place. If we can change the way we think about it, that we as a culture understand the process, then we can help everyone, even the students themselves, better understand the complex nature of the experience. And that can help the schools offer not just financial aid, but transition aid, so that more of these hardworking young people who are, who've already beat the odds to get in the door, actually make it to graduation, which is the real change in their life. Thank you.